Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it, and it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We were sharing with you on the subject of the heart in the last three times we've been together, and today we're going to share on the subject of the soul. Very important that we understand about the soul. And as we bring forth these messages, we're going to be talking about the soul and how the enemy works against your soul, how we develop a strong, victorious soul established in him, how what the enemy uses to damage your soul, and how God will heal and restore your soul, which is what he purposes to do. In 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 5, and verse 23, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's notice, you and I are made of spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit, you have a soul made up of your will, intellect, and emotions, and you live in a physical body. When it talks about the soul, this is talking about that which really makes up your life as a person, your personality as such, because it's translated soul 58 times, but it's also translated life 40 times. <clears throat> Remember that when God breathed the breath of life into man, he became a living soul. And that's what happened. We become a living soul, a personality. It's different from your mind. Your mind is where you think, but it influences your soul, which is your will, the way you choose, your intellect, the way you reason, and your emotions, the way you feel. That is really the seat of the soul. Now, it's important that we understand that, of course, there is a difference. We see here that it's already shown. Another scripture that shows there's a difference between them both is in Hebrews chapter 4, over in verse 12. The Word of God is quick or alive, powerful, I mean, it's active and operative, and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Again, showing that soul and spirit are different. There is a division between them. Spirit is who you are on the inside. The soul is that personality from what you have as a will, intellect, and emotions. Now, it's important that you have your soul healed, restored, renewed, and see all the things that God purposes in it, because 3 John verse 2 says this, Beloved, the King James says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. The word wish actually is the word eukomai, which means to pray. I pray, the word above actually means concerning. It's the, it's the word peri, which really means concerning. I pray concerning, this is the way he translates it, concerning correctly. I pray concerning all things that thou mayest prosper, which is to have a good journey, and to be in health, that you would be healed and whole, even as thy soul prospers. Notice that your health and your overall prosperity or having a good journey is all tied into the prosperity of your soul. In other words, as the soul goes, so goes your health and so goes your prosperity in life. That's why we've got to have our soul restored, healed, become strong, be set free from all the bondages of the enemy. Very important. And we see over in Psalms 23, Psalms 23, which is really prophetic of the New Testament era, where it begins, the Lord is my shepherd, and who's that? That's Jesus. He's now the shepherd. You and I are sheep. And what does he accomplish for us? All the things that he speaks of in this psalm. And he says, I shall not want or lack. And he makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. He brings peace. He restoreth my soul. God is at work to restore, to heal, to repair, to turn your soul back to him so that you would be reasoning and choosing according to his ways and that your soul would be in one accord with the Lord and in, in walking in line with his ways. He's always going to lead you in the paths of righteousness. So he's at work to restore your soul. We also see that many of us have had lots of damage in our soul. What does he promise? Psalms 41 verse 4, I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. How did our soul get messed up? Through sin. Sin has given place to the enemy. Remember what happens when we sin? 
<coughs> when we sin, we give place to the devil, and the evil spirits will come in, and they will cause damage in the area of our soul, affecting our will, our intellect, or our emotions. So God wants to heal and s deliver and set your soul free so it would be restored back to the things of the Lord. Now, it's important also that we understand that your mind is influencing in your soul, and then as you think in that soulish realm, it is going to direct you. In Proverbs chapter 23, we see in verse 7, <clears throat> here the King James says, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. There's a mistake here in the King James. The word heart, when I put the cursor over it, is not the word for heart, which is L-E-B, number 3820, I think it is, in the Hebrew when it goes to Strong's. But instead, if you notice below, it's the word nefesh, nefesh, which is number 5315, which is translated soul the majority of the time, of course, throughout the New Testament. And you see, you don't even see, it's only tr it's translated heart 15 times. Who knows why they did it, but it was error. It should be soul. There's a different word for heart. So this says, as he thinketh in his soul, so is he. Again, as your soul goes, so goes your whole life. This is why the word is not only written in your heart, the inner man within, but it's also written in your mind so that your mind can influence your soul because as you're thinking in that soulish realm, so are you. As your soul goes, so will everything else in your life. Now, in Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, we see something important. First of all, in verse 23, Here's Jesus said to them all, he said, If any man will come after me, that's one who's seeking after him, let him deny himself. What's the first thing we're supposed to do? Deny ourselves. We cannot walk in our ways any longer. And take up his cross daily. The cross is where something is put to death. What is to be put to death daily? All the works of the flesh, all the deeds of the body are to be put to death. Because we're not going to be run by our body any longer. The flesh and the voice of the flesh, its feelings, wants to just walk according to the desires of the flesh. Well, it has not been changed, and it desires things contrary to God's Word. So we're going to deny ourselves, we're going to crucify the flesh daily, and then we're going to follow Him. But He says something else further in verse 24. Whosoever will save his life, here's a place where the word suke, which is the word for soul, has been translated life referring to your soul realm life, or that which is being directed by and run from your soul. Whoever will save his soul realm life, he's going to shall lose it, or the word is apolemy, which means to destroy it. He will actually destroy it, because if he's running his life from his soul, he's not going, walking according to God's word. He's walking according to the ways of the world, or the ways of the flesh, or a mind renewed from the enemy, from the ways of the world and you're going to walk in sin, and you're going to be destroyed. But whosoever will destroy, again this word apolemy, destroy his soul realm directed life, for my sake the same shall save it. This tells you that your soul's important, but your soul is not to be dominant. Your soul is to come in line with God's ways, but you do not be, you're not led by your soul. You are led by your spirit. You are led in line with the Word of God. You never let your soul dictate what it wants to do without submitting it to the Spirit. And you submit it to the Spirit when you submit it to the Word of God. This is why the Word is, of course, to be written in our heart and in our mind. Now, it's important that we not let the enemy have place in our life because the enemy will try to work against your soul. That is one of the major areas of the battleground against the enemy. And we see over in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 8, in verse 35, he says this, Whoso findeth me, findeth life. How do we find him? Through the Word. Study the Word. We find him. He is the Word. And what's going to happen? The life of God will be manifest in us and shall obtain favor of the Lord. So as you seek after him, you're in his Word, you're hearing and doing his Word, you're going to see the life of God, you're going to see the favor of God work in your life. But he that sinneth against me, who's the one who sins against him? The one who does not walk in line with his word. The one who refuses or is rebellious to his word. Wrongeth his own soul. Notice that statement. 
When you sin against God, it has an effect upon your soul. This is how the enemy can get to you. This is why he wants you to walk in the ways of sin. We've got to guard ourselves against sin, and we've talked about how important that is. If you sin, not only will it take a toll upon your body, but it also will take a toll upon your soul. We've got to guard ourselves. Well, it's important that we look at how the enemy works against us, and we're going to primarily look at that today. In Leviticus chapter 4, we pick up here in verse 2. He says, Speaking of the children of Israel, saying, If a soul sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, shall do anything against them. This means that you can sin through ignorance, not knowing something. Well, you'd think, well, how, if I didn't know it, how could I sin if I didn't know I was doing wrong? Because you're responsible to know what the Word says. When you got born again, you received Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior. You came into covenant relationship with Him. Now, you are to know the word of the covenant. And the Holy Spirit will reveal the ways of the Lord and bring revelation knowledge to you of His ways. So you and I are responsible to know the ways of the Lord. In fact, we see a scripture over in Leviticus 5, 17 that's similar. It says, if a soul sin, and your soul's talking about your will, your intellect, your emotions. You know you can sin from your soul or you can sin from your body, whatever you yield to and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist or knows it not, this means no, though he knows it not, yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity. That means the fact that if you walk in the ways of sin, and how would you walk in sin? By doing things contrary to the commandments of the Lord. Even if you don't know it, you're ignorant of it. You're still guilty and you're still going to bear your iniquity. That's why it's very important that we know the Word of God. In Leviticus chapter 7, verse 21, so sin through ignorance will allow the enemy to work against us in our soul. Leviticus chapter 7, verse 21, he says, Moreover, the soul that shall touch any unclean thing as the uncleanness of man, or any unclean beast, or abominable unclean thing, eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which pertains to the people, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. What he's showing, the fact that any uncleanness is going to affect your relationship with the Lord. Well, we see over in the New Testament, see all these things in the Old Testament are all pointing towards New Testament realities in our relationship with Him. We see over in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. If we touch anything that's unclean, anything that would be contrary to the way of righteousness and the way of holiness, the way of His Word. What's going to happen? He's not going to receive us. But if we don't touch the unclean thing, then He will receive us. This is why, of course, He also says, be separate, which means to mark off the boundaries. You need to set the boundaries. I am not going to yield any of my members unto the area of sin. Those are off limits. I've set the boundaries, and that's the way I'm going to live my life. In Leviticus chapter 20, so we can't be touching unclean things or the enemy will get to us. Leviticus 20, verse 6. It says, The soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits or after wizards to go a whoring after them will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Familiar spirits and wizards are those people that are involved in witchcraft. If you ever were involved in witchcraft in any aspect, fortune teller, palm reading, Ouija board, any kind of involvement, any kind of witchcraft, uh, seance, calling, psychics, lines, whatever it might be, then evil spirits came into you and it damaged your soul. So here, these spirits have come into you and this is why we've got to separate ourselves from everything that's evil. That would include anything to do with Halloween. It's all about honoring the Lord of Death, Sam Hain. If you haven't read the book, The Truth About Halloween, you need to read it so you understand why it is evil. You must understand the history so you understand what it's all about. We should have nothing to do with Halloween, nothing to do with any evil spirits. Do not ever call any psychic lines or seek after anybody that is involved in witchcraft. If you have in the past, of course, we can get set free by casting out the spirits. Another way that our soul gets messed up, Leviticus 22, verse 3. Say unto them, Whosoever he be of all your seed among your generations that goeth into the holy things, 
which the children of Israel hallow unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. Otherwise, you're not going to enter into the holy things of God with sin in the camp or uncleanness upon you. That's why we need to be sure that we've confessed our sins. And what does the Bible say? He will forgive us of our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all the uncleanness. So you want to be sure that you confess your sins whenever you have committed them and not yield unto them. Otherwise, you will not be able to go into the holy things of the Lord, and of course it will do damage to your soul. Over in Leviticus 26, we see over in verse 14, If you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, if you shall despise my statutes, or if you abhor my judgment, so that you will not do my commandments, but that you break my covenant, then starts talking about all these curses that will come upon him, all kinds of destruction from then on. So notice, disobedience, not hearkening to his voice, not doing his commandments, even despising his statutes or a soul abhorring his judgments. If we don't do his commandments, we break covenant with him. We don't want to break covenant with him. Whenever we break covenant with him, we, of course, give place to the devil. That's how the devils can come in, and they're going to come in and bring destruction against your soul. In Numbers chapter 21, Numbers chapter 21 and verse 4, here we see something else. It says, They journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea. This is talking about the children of Israel after they came out of Egypt. To compass the land of Edom, and the soul, the people, was much discouraged because of the way. They were discouraged, impatient, grieved, upset because of the way. Why? God didn't take them the straight way into the promised land. He took them the way where they had to deal with all their enemies. Why? Because it's a revelation that the only way you can ever enter into the promises of God in your life, which is the promised land as a type of, is by confronting all of your enemies. Remember that the angel sent them up against all their enemies, not away from them. They had to confront them and they all had to be cut off. In like manner, you have to confront every devil, every evil thing in your life that's come in from inheritance, your own sins or victimization, and we've got to cast it out. Well, they didn't like it. They were discouraged because of the way. They were looking for the easy way. So we see the same problem in the body of Christ today. Everybody has always tried the easy way. Give me the easy way. That's why they want to believe their lying doctrines, that grace is just automatic in my life, that I'm perfectly righteous when I'm born again, that I can't be cursed and all these things, you know, because Jesus redeemed the curse, so it's impossible for me to be cursed failing to realize that that was legally in Christ instead of experientially. But they believe all these lying things because they're looking for the easy way to be right with God and to possess the promises. When God instead said, no, you're going to come against your enemies, and yes, you're going to have to cast out all those devils, and you're going to have to triumph over the enemy in your life. They were much discouraged because of the way. We see the same problem today in the body of Christ. Don't try to go any way except for God's way. And don't let yourself get discouraged or impatient or frustrated or grieved about the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord is right because you have to deal with every enemy and drive it out in order to see the restoration in your soul and in your body. We see in Numbers chapter 30, in verse 2, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. If you swear an oath or you vow a vow, it is bound to your soul. That's why you want to be very watchful of how you do things. Don't be vowing vows or swearing oaths or getting yourself bound to things that you don't know or aren't 100% sure are the right thing. <clears throat> you are binding your soul with a bond and you are, must perform that word. If you don't, you break his word, then you are breaking that vow. You're to do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. This is why I've told people for years, people say, well, should I, you know, they've, from other churches I've contacted people, and they say, well, should I have a pledge and vow a vow to give such and such amount to a church. You know, a lot of churches, they go around, they try to get you to vow a certain amount for the year, pledge a certain amount for the year. They want to lock you in.
Don't ever do that. It's contrary to Scripture. What are we supposed to do? We're to bring all of our tithes into the storehouse that there might be meat in mine house. The tenth belongs to him, so you bring your tithe unto him. That's something you do willingly from your heart, not because somebody came and coerced you to try to get you to do it. And also, giving of offerings is free will offerings that you give. You don't just do it because, you know, I vow, uh, you know, somebody wants me to do such and such. You do it out of a free will. You don't let yourself be coerced. Also, if you go to some meeting with some speaker sometime and they're trying to take, you know, get you to give in their 20-minute spiel about how you should give to their ministry or whatever, or take three or four offerings, you know, some places and all kinds of crazy things that people have done, don't ever let yourself be pressured into giving. That is manipulation that it works. And unfortunately, there have been a lot of people in the body of Christ that have done that. No, you need to be doing things out of free will. Watch that you don't vow vows to anything. If you vow a vow, it's always going to be unto the Lord. Don't do it to man. And you better be sure that whatever you vow to the Lord, you're going to carry out because you will be responsible for it because you bind your soul with a, bow, a bond. Now, if you have done that in the past, you've got to carry it out. You know, one person said, well, I committed to give such and such to someone's ministry, and in someone's ministry, the guy went down the tubes, he was, something's wrong, he, he did a lot of bad things, and I found, discovered a lot of evil things. Too bad, you still bound your soul. You know, you're responsible. You made a mistake in doing that. You always do things unto the Lord. Anybody ever tried to get me to do it? I said, people call you on the phone, they're trying to get you to pledge or give such and such. I never let anybody coerce me in that. I always tell them, I will pray and I will do what God wants me to do. Thank you for your call. I appreciate knowing the need. Have a great day. Bye. I don't let them coerce me into doing anything on the phone. Don't let people coerce you into things. Guard yourself because they'll play on your emotions and on the need and all these kind of things at that moment in time. You pray and find out what God wants you to do so you don't hang up later and say, oh boy, I, I, sh I got coerced into that and shouldn't, well, didn't. How many times have we done things that we later we realized it was the wrong thing and I shouldn't have done it? So guard yourself against that. In Judges chapter 16, Judges chapter 16, but see all these things, they bind your soul and then you've got to perform it. Judges 16, 16, here's another way that the enemy gets to your soul. This is speaking about Delilah when he, she, he came, she came after Samson. It came to pass that when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. What did he do? Then he finally told her all his heart. He said how the razor had not come upon his head and his hair was cut, then his strength would be gone. Notice what she did. She pressed him daily with her words. What will the devil do? The devil will press you daily, somehow, with words, feelings, works, or whatever. Try to keep working at you and working at you and working at you and working at you. You've got to learn to resist the enemy steadfast. If someone's used to the devil that keeps pressing you, trying to manipulate you cons constantly, it starts to get to your soul, to vex your soul, to get you to do something. That's manipulation and control and dominance on their part. Don't let anybody press you daily with their words. You get away from that person. And you speak against those words because they're having a negative effect against you. Because of the fact that he didn't get away from her, then it got to him and it caused him to finally tell what, of course, he shouldn't have told. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we see something else about how the enemy gets to your soul. Here it says, Speaking about Hannah, it says she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Well, when she prayed, God answered, but she shouldn't have been in bitterness and soul to begin with. She should have just been praying and looking to the Lord to show her what to do. But she got bitter because she didn't see the promise of having a child when she wanted to have, how she wanted everything. She was bitter about it because she was barren at that point. Don't let yourself get bitter over not seeing a promise or something come to pass in your life. God's promises are sure and steadfast, and He is able and willing to perform His Word in our life. If we have not seen something happen, there's a reason. It could be because we haven't driven all the enemies out. It could be because if we're dealing with a person, someone else, they don't, they're resistant. There could be all kinds of different reasons why. But there's a reason why. But one thing's for sure, God will perform his word. Don't ever get bitter over things that haven't happened in your life. Just keep on letting God work in your life to set you free from all your bondages and keep praying the word. He will bring 
the promise of God to pass in your life. We see also what produces bitterness over here in Job chapter 7. Got to guard yourself from bitterness. Job 7.11, he says, Therefore I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Don't be a complainer. Don't be a griper. Don't be speaking out of anguish of the situation. That's the devil wanting you to do that. It's going to do damage to your soul. Watch your mouth so you don't do damage unto your soul. It is having an effect upon you. Don't be a complainer or a griper. If so, confess that sin, repent, turn from it. But know that it has affected you and brought a bitterness of soul. If you have that tendency, you need to start casting those complaining spirits out of you instead of being a complainer and a griper. Look what happens if you allow that to come into you. Staying on that subject for a moment, over in Isaiah chapter 38, down here in verse 14, or verse 15, I mean. What shall I say then? He that hath both spoken unto me and done himself, himself hath done it shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. He was resigning himself for, to be bitter all of his life because of all these things that had occurred. Don't ever resign yourself to stay in a depressed state or a bitter state or a negative state or whatever it is because of your circumstances. God can change everything. He can deliver you and heal you and set you free. O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit, so wilt thou recover me and make me to live. For behold, for peace I had great bitterness. If you have bitterness, you will never have peace in your life. But thou hast loved, and my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. How would you get to this place of having this great bitterness? Sin, sin, let it come in. Don't get bitter over things. Don't get bitter over a marriage that failed, over a person that did this, over what happened on the job, or what happened with this child or son, whatever the circumstance. Don't get bitter over what's going on in the economy or in the government, regardless of what happens down the line. We're continuing to pray and standing for righteousness. At the same time, don't get bitter about circumstances. That's a mistake. You keep your eyes on the Lord. He will perform His Word. He will show you the way. He will bring forth His promises in your life. You've got to guard yourself, and that is very important. We see another scripture over in Job, how the enemy gets to you in the area of your soul. We've got to guard our soul. In Job 19, verse 2, how long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? Words, they can break you in pieces. Remember that stupid jingle as a child? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's a lying jingle. Words can destroy you. Words can break you in pieces and vex your soul. Word curses that might have come into you from things you heard as you were growing up. You're no good. I wish you was never born. You're never going to amount to anything. You're always going to be a failure, on and on and on. If those words were spoken over you any time in your life, those spirits came into you and they have continued to work at you. And maybe you've heard that within you time after time after time, resounding within you. That's the devils beating you down from those word curses that came against you. Words are important. Watch the words you speak. If you don't have good words to speak, zip it. You don't, should not be speaking negative words against anybody. Don't be speaking the words that are condemning or cutting someone down or, or negative in some way. Speak words that encourage. Speak words that build up. Speak words that will bring strength. Speak words if you're bringing correction. Speak, speak words that bring the answer, but not with an attitude. You shouldn't have an attitude. That's going to be the devil working at you, and you're going to destroy your soul, and you're going to be using the devil to destroy other people too, because your words with the wrong attitudes, these words will go in and bring destruction against people. So watch the words that you speak. Psalms chapter 3. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up me. That's right, there's a lot of many devils we have to deal with. Many there be which say of my soul, there's no help for him in God. You can tell that this is a spiritual principle. It's talking about all the physical things are physical types and shadows of spiritual realities. Say of my soul, there's no help for him in God. The devil will try to tell you, there's no help for you with God. Get you to try some other way. 
God's not going to bring this forth. Go the world's way. Try some other way. Try to do it yourself. On and on and on. Ah, that's the devil deceiving you. He's been working at your mind, whispering at you. There's no help for you in God. Anything that turns you away from looking to God as your help, the devil has got to you. Through a feeling, through an attitude, through a th words, whatever it might be, through circumstance that you see and try to draw some kind of conclusion, the devil will work all kinds of different ways at you. He's trying to get to your soul, and he is a liar. You've got to resist him. Psalm 6, verse 3. My soul is sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Say, so how long do I have to put up with this? Well, in the New Testament, we have authority over the devil, and we can cast out the devils. We can confess our sin. We can repent. We can turn. We can get the word in us. We can walk in the word. It's going to be as long as it takes for you to do what he says. And he'll turn everything around. As long as it takes for you to get these devils out. That's how long. Don't be good thinking how long. The Lord, like the Lord, you know, he's got to do something about this. He's given you and I authority in the New Testament. Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. Save me for thy mercy's sake. Well, in the New Testament, he did. Jesus did come. And what did he do? He brought a victory. He redeemed us out of the enemy's hand. He now is your deliverer, your healer, your restorer, your victory, your peace. And his mercies are new every morning. And he will bring you out of the bondage of your life. Psalm 7, we see something further. O Lord, my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. And the devil likes to use people to persecute you. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces while there's none to deliver. The devil likes to tear your soul apart. That produces a fragmented soul. That's how people get into mental problems. That's how they get into all emotional problems and all kinds of things that, that affect them and their soul and get beat up and destroyed. He's trying to tear your soul apart, rending it in pieces. Now the world out there thinks that you're, they call you schizophrenic with all these different personalities and so forth. That's essentially a soul that's been kind of rendered in pieces, so to speak, when all these devils have come in and they're all in these areas and they keep on manipulating and we're trying to work in your life. In reality, what you have is just a bunch of evil spirits that have come in from all kinds of things, and they have done damage to your soul. Our soul needs to get whole. It needs to get delivered. It needs to get healed and restored. So they might be persecuting you, trying to tear your soul. And if someone's trying to be and use the devil to persecute you and get after you, get away from that person. Start binding the devils in that person. Start speaking the word to that person. If the person wants to be used to the devil, you know what the best thing you can do? Walk in love towards them, pray for them, bind the demons, and start sharing the gospel with them. How much Jesus loves them. How much God wants to bless them. How Jesus went to the cross and bore away their sins. How they can be born again. That'll shut them up. That'll back them off because they won't want to hear that for long or else they'll repent one or the other. And you keep on. You overcome evil with good. You pour out the gospel. And God will, in the meantime, you're binding the devils and taking dominion over them in their life. In Psalms 13, remember, don't get in the flesh and retaliate against them and get mad or upset about what people do. Hey, you played right in the devil's hands. And now he's going to destroy your soul more because you've given place to it. Psalms 13, verse 2. How long shall I take counsel in my soul? Now, are we supposed to take counsel in our soul apart from our spirit, apart from the word? No. Having sorrow in my heart daily. There's counsel from the soul, poor old me, all this negative stuff. What's it produce? Whatever you're doing through your, all your, act, your faculties, remember, is getting into your heart. The gateway into your heart is through your mind, what you see, what you speak, what you're thinking upon, what you're hearing, all these things. Don't take counsel in your own soul apart from the Word of God and allow sorrow. I'm never good enough. I never can amount to the, do anything. You know, I've made all these mistakes. Everything's so terrible, you know. You know, condemning yourself, all this negative. Cut it out. It's that you're playing into the devil's hands. Instead, get your eyes on the Lord. Start speaking the word. Start thinking on the things that God wants you to think on. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? As long as you keep on having that kind of counsel in your soul, pouring that evil stuff into your heart, he'll keep on beating you up left and right. You're just playing right into his hands. Hey, let's turn the tables on the enemy. Let's not let him be exalted over us anymore in our life. 
we see another scripture over in Psalms 24. Psalms 24. Who shall ascend of the hill of the Lord, in verse 3, or who shall stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands, pure heart, not lifted up his soul unto vanity or worthless empty things. Why do we lift up our soul to worthless, worthless things of this world? Are they profiting you? Are they helping you? Are they bringing healing and deliverance to you? Are they strengthening you? Are they building you up with the things of the Word of God? Or are they just a bunch of time wasters? Or are they good for a little fun for a season and all these kind of things? They're all worthless. These things are going to damage you. You don't want any of this vanity, emptiness, things that are, have nothingness, things that are worthless. They're destructive to you. These, you're not going to enter in to the holy hill of the Lord. We see in Psalms 31, verse 9, he says this, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eyes consume with grief. Yea, my soul and my belly. Notice, grief will affect your eyes. If you get the grief, it will start affecting your eyesight. My soul and my belly. My life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. <sighs> Everything's going so bad, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, all this down in the mouth stuff. Well, that's the devil who just beat you up left and left, left and right, and you just keep playing into his hands. We've got to guard our soul. We cannot let the enemy have place. My ears were signed. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity. That's why your strength fails, because of the sin. And my bones are consumed. It'll start working on your bones. So it'll affect you physically and in the area of your soul realm. That's why you can't let yourself get into grief, sorrow, sadness, all this stuff. No. You get your eyes on the Lord and keep a rejoicing spirit. Psalms 35, verse 4. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Now, who's that? The devils. The devils are trying to come to your soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. What does that tell you? All hurts and wounds and damage you've had in your emotions has been the devil. He's been seeking after your soul. He knows how to use people. And he will just bring them along the line to work at you, to bring, inflict some hurts and wounds and damaged emotions, get you upset, get you all, they hurt me, you know, they, they, they rejected me, poor old me stuff. Get you to react like that. And if you haven't learned to come out of the me, 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 I, I, I reaction mentality, you're getting beat up left and right. We gotta turn away from this. You, should never, you can live above hurt if you walk in love all the time. You can live above all this negative stuff affecting you if you don't react out of me, 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 I, 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 what they did to me. That's all out of the soul. You're essentially living your life from your soul when you react that way. And you're playing right into the hands of the enemy. All of the hurts, all of the wounds have come from the devil working in some manner. And it doesn't have to happen. Jesus was rejected of men. Did he have all this hurts, wounds, sorrow, grief, beat up in him? No. He understood where they were at. He, just didn't leave. he resisted everything that the enemy brought against him. Remember, he was tempted in all points yet without sin. He had the opportunity to get beat up in all these things, but he didn't give place to it because he understood what was going on. The enemy was trying to get to his soul. Psalms 42, verse 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Cast down, depressed, discouraged, poor old me, negative. And why art thou disquieted? This guy is murmuring, he's upset, he's troubled within. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. What's your answer? Hope in God. God's your answer. His word gives you hope. And as you put your faith in operation, it'll bring your hopes into manifestation. We see it again over here in verse 11. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I'll yet praise him who's the health of my countenance. Who's the health of your countenance? The Lord. Get your eyes on Him. He's your healer, your deliverer, your peace, <clears throat> your strengthener. He will bring you out of it. And again, we see it again over in Psalms 43 and verse 5. Again, the same thing. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? God does not want your soul cast down. He does not want you to get disquieted, getting upset within you. If that is happening, you are letting the devil get to you. And we've got to realize the battlegrounds in the area of the soul. Psalms 54, verse 3. For strangers are risen up against me. 
people see him come out of nowhere. What's this guy's even a stranger? The devil's using coming after me. You know, a lot of times it's just your friends or people around that the devil seems to use, and then strangers all become, and they'll start being targeting at you. Hey, the devil.